Good morning, brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God, the ground and pillar of the truth. Hi. Get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn with me in the authorized version of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be looking in the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 16, as in regards to verses 17 and 18, which we will get to. But we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13, okay? Please follow me along in the scriptures. I am using two sets of scripture for this video. <clears throat> Let us begin. Beginning at verse 13, we are going to read from verse 13 on to verse 28 in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And right away, think about the rich young ruler who came up to the Lord and said, Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And our Lord says what? Why callest thou me good? There is one good, that is God. The rich young ruler came to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, seeing only a man. That was it. And remember too, in the book of Luke, when our Lord went into the house of the Pharisee and the woman came behind our Lord Jesus Christ, weeping at his feet, okay? That Pharisee said in his heart, this man were a prophet. He would have known what kind of woman this is because she is a sinner. And our Lord was like, Shimon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And he says what? Master, say on. So when our Lord asks, whom do men say that I am? John the Baptist? Elias? Jeremiah? Or one of the prophets? They only saw a man. He saith unto them, verse 16, But whom say ye that I am? Some people will take this and say and try to use this as an excuse for relativism, which this is not. No, absolutely not. No, no. In his first question, regular men who knew of Jesus only saw him as a prophet, but not as the son of David, God the Father, their promised Messiah. Because remember, our Lord Jesus Christ was sent on to the lost sheep of Israel. It is to the Jew first, and also on to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile, okay? But when he says here, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? It's not talking about relativism, that it is relative unto the person's perspective what truth is. No, 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 no. Absolute truth is absolute truth. Thank you. Verse 16, And Shimon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Go to John chapter 6. Hold your place there and go to John. John chapter 6. I should have had the other scriptures open. John chapter 6, verses 64 on to 70. John chapter 6. We're going to be looking in John chapter 6 quite a bit today. 
Uh, so not quite a bit, but you'll see. Verse 16 in Matthew chapter 16. And Shimon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. John chapter 6, beginning at verse 64 on to verse 70. Jesus speaking. But there are some of you that believe not. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 64 and verse 70. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said unto them, and he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my father. Now that is not talking about Calvinism, okay, elect and non-elect. One of these days I'm going to get to get around to doing a video on that specifically because Calvinism, elect and non-elect, is so heretical. And it's quite shocking to find out how many people actually adhere to that. Really, it's really weird. But God today, in this dispensation, will have all men to be saved. And he draws you on to himself. By shewing you truth through one of uh, through one of his body, the Church of the Living God, okay, through the Scriptures, what have you, okay, he will draw you on to himself. You do not make the decision upon yourself one day to go seeking for the Lord. He draws you by grace. Ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, okay? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Shimon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God, that Christ, the Christ, anointed one. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Let's read verse 71. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Shimon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, when you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, and Shimon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And compare that with John here, um, chapter 6, verses 68 and 69. Then Shimon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember verse 65. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. Drawn with cords of love. Remember, Right here in John chapter 6, right here in Matthew chapter 16. This is before the crucifixion. Still doctrinally under the law. Okay? Keep that in mind. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Shimon bar Jonah, bar, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. While we're here in John, go to John 6, verses 37, on to verse 47. John chapter 6, verses 37, on to verse 47. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, 
but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he, how is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Aha! We see a clue in verses 41 and verses 42. Look back here at uh, Matthew chapter 16. Verses 13 and verse 14. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, go back to John chapter 6. Look at verse 26 and 27 in John chapter 6. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, the miracles that prove that he is God the Father, God manifest in the flesh, the promised Messiah unto the children of Israel, the king of the Jews, the son of David. Okay? Those miracles that he did proved that. According to the scriptures. Okay? But, in verse 26, because he did eat of the loaves and were filled, their God is their belly? Isn't the belly something of flesh? No, in the kingdom of heaven, heaven itself will eat. Yes, but not because our bodies are hungry, but because we can eat and enjoy it. Eating for joy, because we want to, in heaven. And that's something. <laughs> right? But see, verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, the meat. Is not meat flesh? And flesh perisheth? But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And see now the Catholics, this is talking about, um, you know, he where he says, I am the bread of life. Okay, and the Catholics uh, take this and turn it into something literal that the priest, another Christ, has the power to do the transubstantiation, that woody, 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 and turn the round, circular, bale shaped, sun shaped cookie into the body, divinity, guts, eyeballs, toenails, spirit. Everything. The priest, another Christ, according to official Catholic teaching, has the power to turn that sun shape, S U N, sun shaped cookie into Christ himself. And right here we see in verses 26 and 27, he says, Ye seek me, in verse 26, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, the miracles that proved. That he is the son of God, meaning God manifests in the flesh. Okay? That's what that means. Not one of three divine persons which Catholicism teaches. That's heresy. Okay? But no. But the miracles proved unto the Jew that he is the son of David, the king of the Jews. God manifests in the flesh. But they didn't see that. They only saw that he provided their 
uh, food for their belly. Their God was their belly. Flesh. They saw only with the eye of flesh, not the things pertaining to spiritual see. Okay? Aha, yes. So in verse 41 and 42 in John chapter 6, okay? After he had said this, and many had believed on him, remember, not because they saw the miracles, but because their flesh was satisfied. Okay? But then they said, the Jews then murmured at him because I, he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus? Is, who is, you know, they did not see the son of David, the king of the Jews, God the Father. They only saw someone who could provide for their their stomach, their belly. They had eyes of flesh. You get it? Yeah, I know you do. Let's continue. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? And then you look over here at Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, where, he, uh, where Peter says, and Shimon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. While other men were saying merely of him that he was John the Baptist or Elias, Elijah, or Jeremiah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See that distinction? There are those today who see Jesus as an errand boy. Someone merely to give them what they're Lusts desire, because they can they see only in terms of flesh, not of spirit, because they are spiritually discerned. They are natural, unregenerate. Jesus, therefore, uh, continuing in John chapter six, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. For by grace are ye saved through faith. You're not going to just one day, you know, wake up and be like, hmm, I think I'm going to become a Christian today. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. He draws you onto himself. He would have all men to be saved. And he seeks to draw all men onto him. But see, there's that little thing called self-righteousness that gets in the way of so many people. Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Everlasting life. And where he says, not that any man has seen the Father, the soul of the Godhead. The Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. Okay? You and I were made in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. Just like our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he says later on in the book of John to Philip about where Philip says, Shew us the Father and it shall suffice us. And he said, have I not been long, so long with you and thou hast not known me, Philip? Meaning that Jesus Christ is the Father. Okay? But when he says that, he's talking about the soul. You can't see the soul. You can't see my soul and I can't see your soul. See? Okay? But the point is, being drawn onto the Lord, he will draw all men onto him. When he is lifted up, he will draw all men onto him. Does that mean that every man is going to come to him? 
No, because remember, our Lord is not forcing you at gunpoint to come unto him. You have free will, Mr. Calvinist. Okay? I will confess, sometimes that I wish we didn't. But we do. Because God doesn't want a robot. You understand? I hope so. But see, when it says here in verse 17, go back to Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Shimon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Because look at what flesh and blood has said already, what we looked at, right? They see only one of the prophets, a mere man. Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. Most of these people didn't see that because they didn't have eyes to see. Shimon Barzona, he saw that. Why? Because my father, uh, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. Because, verse 44 in John 6, no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. And remember that today in this dispensation, we are saved by grace, through faith. Okay? It is by God's grace, through our faith. Okay? His hand is there. He has called on to you. Will you hearken? Will you hearken? But now, go to verse 18. Now, I, I touched on this a little yesterday in the video I did, but we're going to touch on it uh, pretty pretty profoundly here. And this, this right here, verses 18 and 19, are woo -hoo -hoo, very big unto the Catholic. Okay? Because according to official Roman Catholic teaching, you can search the catechisms yourself. According to the Catholics, verse 18 is where Christ made Peter the first pope. Okay? And in verse 19, that is where he gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Aha! Meaning unto the Catholic that Peter, as the head of the church, has the power to cast, uh, to forgive sins, and to withhold people from going to heaven. Essentially, the Catholic takes verse 18 and verse 19 and twists it to show, to teach that Peter was basically made another Christ. And they call the poop, the vicar of Christ, another Christ. And every Jesuit Roman Catholic priest, according to official Roman Catholic doctrine, is another Christ. Okay? That is what the Catholic teaches. Right here, verses 18 and 19 are very important unto the Catholic. Very important. This is how they deceive so many. And if you check out the video that was done yesterday, I showed you that uh, uh, thing of Alberto Rivera, the comic book that is his testimony. If I can remember, I'll try to link that video in this video. Okay? Uh, that, that's woo, very big onto the Catholic. But see, there again, you got to remember, the Catholic also knows that the authorized version of the scriptures is against them. Totally against them. Okay, but what is this saying? Okay, what is verses 18 and 19 saying? Okay, well, let's look. We're going to start in verse 18 and then get into 19. Okay, this is going to be the meat of this video. Okay, I was roundabout asked to do something about this. I had mentioned about this before in a video I had done before. Uh, I couldn't at gunpoint tell you which one I said uh, mentioned it, so this is going to be it, okay, officially. So let's look at this. 
Verse 18, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. Okay? Surname. Shimon. Shimon Peter. Surname was Peter. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, look at verse 18, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. John chapter 1, verses 40 on to verse 42. John chapter 1, verses 40 on to verse 42. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Shimon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Shimon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Shimon, the son of Jonah, bar Jonah. Okay, that's what bar means. Thou shalt be called Kephas, Kephas, Peter, which is by interpretation a stone, a stone, a stone. So, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, a stone. Kephas, Peter, which is by interpretation a stone. Okay? Interesting. Go to Genesis chapter 2. First mention, first mention of stone. Uh, we are going to look at the very first three occurrences of the word stone in the authorized version of the scriptures. This is called first mention, the law of first mention. Usually when you see a word in the scripture the first time, the first time it appears usually is the definition of that word. Usually. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 2, verse 12. And you're going to notice something here. You're going to notice something. Now, looking at uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And we see that it's Kephas, which is an interpretation of stone. Kephas, Peter, Kephas, Peter, one and the same. Means a stone. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 12. And the gold of that land is good. There is the bedlam and the onyx stone. Onyx stone. Onyx, a precious stone. Okay? Onyx, a beautiful looking stone. Okay? Beg your pardon. Okay? Now go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. Onyx stone. A precious stone for a covering. You know, like a jewel, that kind of thing. Onyx stone. Okay? Genesis 11, verse 3. Genesis 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. And slime had they for mortar. Bricks are made. Not, you know, God doesn't from heaven say, there's a brick. No. Brick is something that man makes. Okay? They made brick. You read that in Exodus. How they had uh, to uh, gabble, uh, gather stubble to make bricks. Okay? So they say here that and they had brick for stone. Stone. They made bricks. What did they make the bricks out of? Stone. Okay? 
and slime had they for mortar. So in Genesis 2.12, it's the onyx stone, a jewel, right? Okay, a precious stone. And here, Genesis 11.3, brick for stone, something to build with. Okay, okay. And now go to Genesis 19, verse 24. 19, verse 24. These are just the first three appearances. There are many others of stone. But, okay, the first, very first appearance was likened unto what? An onyx stone, a precious stone. The second one was a brick. Brick for stone. Okay? This one, verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone. And fire from the Lord out of heaven. Brimstone. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Okay, let's read verse 22 and verse 23 in Matthew chapter 16. Okay, Jesus says that I'm going to Jerusalem to die, bury, and rose, rise again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, he's going to pay for sin, to shed his blood on the cross. Peter says, no, 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 no. That, let this far be from you. Okay, let this be far from you, excuse me. Uh, proving that they were not looking forward to the cross. Okay? What does Jesus say to him? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men, of flesh, just like Roman Catholicism. It's all about flesh. It's all about flesh. And someone defending flesh has ties onto Catholicism. You mark my words. Okay? So, Jesus refers to Peter as Satan. Peter was not Satan, but Satan was... Satan was there. Satan was influencing Peter at that time because you got to remember, at this time... Peter was not saved or converted. He was not. You have to remember that. Okay? Because Peter himself said, though all the world deny you, yet I won't. And then when his feet were put to the fire, he denied the Lord three times. Okay? Okay? I also have a video about the uh, Peter, the first pope, which I will put in this video. Okay? But, Note those three appearances thus far of stone. Let me show you something. Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Remember the first appearance of a uh, stone was uh, likened onto an onyx stone? Precious jewel. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 on to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 on to verse 19. He is talking about Satan here. Not the king of Tyrus. And notice the king of Tyrus and Peter. And yet the Lord addresses Satan, not the king of Tyrus, here in Ezekiel 28. The Lord addresses uh, Peter, uh, Satan, not Peter. He calls Peter Satan. He calls the king of Tyrus Satan, pretty much. But that's because Satan was there. Satan was here. Because Peter was not converted. He was not saved at this time. He was not. What about this king of Tyrus? Oh, and I can feel all you Catholics 
and you Jesuit coadjutors getting all furious about what I just said about your first pope. Good. Good. I hope if you're Catholic and you get offended by that, keep listening. Check out the video about Peter the first pope. Go ahead. But you devil coadjutors, I hope this just irritates you to no end. Some man, uh, verses 12 on to verse 19 in Ezekiel chapter 28. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who is in Eden, the garden of God? Adam, Eve, the serpent. Who is the serpent? That old devil, Satan. You know, the red dragon, Leviathan, Lucifer. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the Onyx and the jas jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, ha, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. And then when you read in Genesis chapter 3, that uh, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord ha God had created. Lucifer is a created being. He is a created being. Okay. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. What was the iniquity in Satan? I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five I wills, five is associated with death. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. We're not going to go there. You had ought to have that at least memorized, at least the address of it in the scriptures. You have, to, you are at least ought to have that memorized, okay? Satan's sin was pride. God hates pride, okay? Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Oh, like brimstone. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, with a K. Therefore will I bring thee, bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. They that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So, every precious stone mentions here about the stones of fire. What about brick? Uh, look at the Roman Catholics. Don't they build buildings? You know, masons get their masons to get uh, to do that, and masons are Roman Catholics. Okay. Yes, 
Yes, there is proof historically that at one time the Masons and the Jesuits, yes, that, yes, okay, yes. Is that the case today? No. No. Alberto Rivera even himself said at the time, and that's provable in his uh, testimony, the comic book, that uh, the Jesuit provincial, the general at that time, was himself a Mason. Yeah. The Jesuits run masonry. Okay. Yes, at one time in history, they, they, yeah, they, there's proof to... To prove that, yes, at one time they fought each other. That well, not anymore. Not anymore. Okay? It's been like that for quite a while. Okay? But, here it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, that thou art Peter. A stone. A stone. A stone. And later on here in Matthew chapter 16, he refers to Peter as Satan. Satan who is influencing Peter. Satan who is influencing this prince of Tyrus. And you, you, want, you want to have a little bit more nuggets on this? Go to Matthew chapter 3 verse 9. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9. Just one verse. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Stones. See, the premise is, people, that stones are very small. Well, a rock? Yeah. Oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 3. And look who happens to be the one speaking. And we, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Stones be made bread. Stones be made flesh. Is not Satan all about flesh? What does it say there in verse 23? For thou savorest not the thing. Uh, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Flesh. Fleshly. As is every single Catholic and coadjutor. You're all about the flesh. <laughs> Prove me wrong. <laughs> Prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah. Scoundrels. But go down to Revelation chapter 17. Am I being tedious with you? Good. Good. Let there be no doubt in your mind. See. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 on to verse 9. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and Precious stones, like their father Satan, an angel of light, transformed into an angel of light. No marvel that his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Purple and scarlet, the bishops and cardinals, their colors are what? 
purple and scarlet. There are those out there who like to say, no, Rome's colors are white and gold. No, 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 no. You see the procession? Look at that video about our Jesuit president, Miss Kamala Harris. Okay? Um, you'll see within that video later on that it's purple and, the purple and scarlet color. The representatives of who? Mystery Babylon. Who is Mystery Babylon? Rome. Roman Catholicism. It's Rome. And apparently there is that, uh, what is, what's that guy's name? Dawson? Apparently even he recently, I have not verified with mine own eyes. A brother has mentioned it to me. I have not verified it, but apparently this Dawson Lawson guy is even saying that America is Babylon. Warning! 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 Henry Morris, who did the Henry Morris Study Bible, he even took away from this. Um, I have also a video proving that, that he took away that it's, like, it's not count, it's actually uh, authentic uh, Babylon, you know, Iraq. And so, no. No. I know there are some of you out there who listen to that Dawson Lawson, whatever his name is. I have not listened to him. I haven't. I have been given tidbits of info on him and by those I trust. That's good enough for me. Okay? But if he's saying that America is Babylon. You have a compromising fake on your hands. Get away from that. Okay? Mystery Babylon the Great. Here, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed. The woman, Mother Church, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written. Mystery Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It's Roman Catholicism. It's Rome. Anybody tells you otherwise. They're lying to you, they're fake, and most likely, they are working for the Vatican. Coadjutors. Okay? And I saw, verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, the blood of the martyrs. Read, read Fox's book of martyrs sometime, brethren. See what horrors Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism, has done to the Church of the Living God. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The mind that has wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Remember, during this time, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. You have to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You can't take the mark of the beast. The mind that has wisdom, wisdom is to fear the Lord. And if someone takes that mark of the beast, they ain't going to fear the Lord. Because somehow, and I totally believe this as well, that mark in their right hand or in their forehead is going to somehow drastically alter their DNA to make them so they would be permanently affected against God. Okay? And of course, our Lord says quite simply, 
If you take that, you're going to hell. There ain't no if, ifs, ands, or buts. And you know about the stuff that they're pushing nowadays, right? You know, if, if they were to do something so drastic, okay, because the thing that they're pushing nowadays has a DNA-altering agent, okay? But if it was so dramatic that if someone did that, okay, and then comes out of there, they go in smiling and they come out all frowning, that would be pretty obvious, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But if it's done subtly, subtle, it's by small increments changing their DNA. Some of them had to do that twice. And look up what's been happening as a result of. Yeah. I'm saying, okay? But. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. It's Roman Catholicism. It's Roman Catholicism. And let's look at verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And verse 19, or excuse me, verse 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, a stone. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We have to go through this in order to explain verse 19. Okay? This is the process that we must go through to establish these things. Get it? So bear with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 1 on to verse 4. First Corinthians chapter 10. Now, okay, Peter is a stone. Comma, and upon this rock. Stone and rock are two different things. Okay? Okay, they're two different things. Stone, precious little uh, stone, like an onyx stone. Brick, they had four stone. And brim stone. And every precious stone was his covering. Stone ain't rock. Stone and rock are made of the same substance, sure. But stone is small. Rock, that's pretty big. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual capital R rock that followed them. You see, you see that? Yeah, you see that? Yeah. Peter is a stone. And it says rock. And that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. Okay. 
go to Exodus. First mention. Exodus. Like I said, we have to go through this. Okay? We have to go through this. Exodus chapter uh, 17. First appearance of rock. And you'll never guess. Well, some of you will. All right, but the context in Exodus chapter 17. <clears throat> Let's read from verses 1 on to verse 7 in Exodus chapter 17. You're going to love this. If you're a babe, pay attention. If you're not, you know what we're reading. Enjoy it. Exodus chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? they be almost ready to stone me. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will, Stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So Moses smote the rock. And water is gushed out of it. Out of thy belly shall proceed rivers of living water. What our Lord said unto the woman at the well. When they stabbed him, out came water and blood. You see the typology here, right? Those of you who are well versed in the scriptures... Who are not babes and ain't nothing wrong with being a babe okay but um if you're a babe you, do you see that smote the rock he was wounded for our transgressions and out of him came living water you get it verse seven and he called the name of the place Massa and meribah because of the chiding of the children of israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? But one second, brother. Okay, sorry about that. My, my chap lips. Okay, beg your pardon. Now, go to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. We want verses 21 on to verse 22. Note this, Exodus chapter 33, verses 21 on to verse 22. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. This is when Moses, after the golden calf, Moses went back up to make, um, to plead for the Lord, plead unto the Lord to forgive the children of Israel for making the golden calf. And he's like, shew me thy glory, Okay. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, 
and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Uh, standing upon a rock, put thee in a cliff of the rock, Go to Numbers. Got to look at Numbers. We have to look at Numbers. Numbers chapter 20, verses 8. Oh, on to verse 13. Seven on verse 13 in Numbers chapter 20. We have to look at this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod. And gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Now, before in Exodus chapter 17, okay, he was commanded to smite the rock. And upon smiting the rock, waters gushed out. And that rock was Christ. Okay, we already looked at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The um, It's likened unto that, okay. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was smitten for our iniquities, okay? He was smitten. Once. One time, Catholic. Okay? He died for sins once. Only once. See, the Catholic, their, their other Christ, their Jesuit priest who has the power to turn a sun-shaped cookie into Christ himself, has the power to call him down and turn that into the flesh, blood, eyeballs, guts, hair, toenails, and everything of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's truly blasphemy. Of course. Of course. But see, wherein he died unto sin, he died once. And the Mass is a continual sacrifice. Okay? That, that is official Roman Catholic teaching. Okay? <laughs> Come on. That is exactly what you Catholics are taught. And if some of you believe that, <laughs> and some of you do, who are Catholic, you, you really do. You, you're nuts. You're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. But see... In that he died, he died unto sin once. One sacrifice. Only once. But no, unto the Catholic. The Jesuit priest, another Christ, turns the round, sun-shaped, that's you when, shaped cookie into the flesh and blood and whatever of Jesus Christ. See, the, the Catholics are all about flesh. And they make a big stink about the flesh. Yeah. But now we see in Numbers 20, verses 7 on to verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak. Not hit him again. Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. After he was smitten, he gives that water. He saves you by grace through faith. You don't have to smite him again. You can't lose your salvation. Today, in this dispensation, uh, during this, under the law, yes, you could lose your salvation. There was no eternal security there. Okay? There wasn't. But once you have tasted of that rock, after he had been smitten, and he gave you water, you speak unto the rock, and he will continue to give you water. You don't smite him again. And Moses took the rod, and notice also in verse eight, uh, 8, So thou shalt give the congregation, the Jews, and their beasts, 
maybe likened unto us Gentiles? Because remember, our Lord before the death, burial, and resurrection referred unto Gentiles as dogs. One thing about us dogs, though, right? They're loyal, ain't they? Yeah. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Bam, bam! Oh, Moses was angry. But when you look at verse 8, Moses was given a commandment. Moses did not obey it. And Moses lifted up his hand, verse 11, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because he believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. So that rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 14, on to verse 24. Psalm 118. Verses 14 on to verse 24. And upon this rock I will build my church. This rock. Peter's a stone. Christ is the rock. Do you get it? Verses 14 on to verse 24 in Psalm 118. Now, oh, we're going to drive this home. Okay? The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Oh, it's a stone there, Brad. But it's not talking about Peter. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our, in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner? Wait, wait for it, okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Come on, fingers work with me. 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 9 on to verse 15. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But take he, but... But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, thereupon. 
For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Upon this rock I will build my church. Talking about himself. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Gold, silver, precious stones, like the onyx stone, um, they will abide fire. Wood, hay, stubble, they get burnt up. Okay? Keep this in mind because this is what we're looking at is going to play a big thing to do with verse 19. Every man shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, whether it's going to be burnt up or it's going to be by, uh, by the fire. Meaning rewards. Really? Yes. 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 We do good works after salvation, not to stay saved but because our heart is right with the Lord okay and we are doing good works for rewards eternal rewards in the kingdom of heaven okay if any man verse 14 if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward the gold, silver, precious stones, works that you are doing for the Lord, that he has called you on to. Not for your salvation or to stay saved, but for rewards, eternal rewards. See. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So see, it's not for salvation. Your uh, works are going to be tried for your rewards. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, let's continue though. Let's continue, come on. Don't get ahead of me. Let's continue, okay? Verse 15. Again, if any man, uh, wait, wait, wait. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, your body, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, hold up, okay? Now hold up. Verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, a stone. And upon this rock himself I will build my church. Call out assembly. The body. They're not buildings. What do Catholics build? Very ornate. Very beautiful looking. Church buildings. Because it's all about flesh. With the Catholic. See. Go to Ephesians. Chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 18 under verse 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 22. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. <laughs> Not the Roman Catholic demigods, the devils. No. No. Someone who is saved is a saint. Okay, not that mumbo, crazy jumbo, that Catholic. Catholics are evil. Catholicism is evil. Catholicism is evil. And the Catholic who has given themselves over onto that, I hope you get out of it and repent. Before it is too late for you. Let's read verse 19 again. 
Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Did you you were following me along in First Corinthians chapter three, right? Yes. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Upon this rock I will build my church. What about that? What about that? Okay. Go to Colossians. Go to Colossians. Okay. Church building. There are some of you that actually believe that. And they're... And surprise, surprise! The devil coadjutors here are really big about putting people in church buildings. Oh, gee! Imagine that! Imagine that! Jesuits! Imagine that! Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 on to verse 18. Check this out. For by him we all, for by him were, excuse me, all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. The church. Who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the head of the body. The church. Not buildings. I, I point over there because there's Saint, there's a Lutheran church over there by where I live. Used to be where I used to live, there was some crazy non-denominational thing. Over here, there's Lutherans. So over there, non-denominational, which is Jesuit. And over here, Lutherans, which are Catholic. Catholics. We're surrounded by Catholics. <laughs> So, you see, churches are not buildings. They're people, persons, spirit, soul, and body. Collective bodies of people. Not buildings, dear friend. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. See how we do that? Ephesians chapter 2, where are you going, Brad? Ephesians chapter 2. We are now going to read verses... 11 on to verse 17 now. See how we did that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 on to verse 17? Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who, were, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the flesh of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. By the blood of Christ. You wicked Catholic. For he is our peace. 
who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Because remember what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Sh shall we go there? Shall we go there? Yeah, hold your place there in Ephesians. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, law was carnal, fleshly. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So when we're looking at right here, where he says, uh, where was that? For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, which we just looked at in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Shut your mouth, you wicked devils. Thank you, pardon. Crazy. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. One body of Jews and Gentiles. He is the head of the body. The church, not the building. Okay? <clears throat> Having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. So, the church is the body of believers, the church of the living God, not a building. So, in verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, a stone, and upon this rock himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, I will build my church, his body, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And have not the gates of hell prevailed against the Roman Catholic Church? Because it is Satan's church. Okay? Now, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven appears only within the book of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is Jerusalem, where our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Son of David, the King of the Jews, is going to be ruling and reigning from for a thousand years. Okay? That is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, every single solitary time within the book of Matthew, where it is the only place it appears, is always talking about the actual physical literal kingdom in Jerusalem. Okay? Oh. Remember that. Okay? Remember that. Okay? The keys to the kingdom of heaven. The keys. Okay? And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. Hmm. Now, for verse 19, let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18.
You're going to see this happen again. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to do some reading here. Okay? Matthew chapter 18. We will be reading verses 1 on to verse 22. Okay? Come on. Now, we will address the key thing here in a bit. But, kingdom of heaven, remember that, up had our Lord Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day yet, according to the scriptures, when he said this? Huh? Huh? No. So then he had not made the perfect atonement for sin yet, had he? No. No, he did not, did he? <gasps> you don't say. Remember that. Okay? Hinge that. Kingdom of heaven. Remember that. Okay? Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 on to verse 22. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted. And become as little children. Ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. A little child is dependent on mommy and daddy. Or daddy and mommy, excuse me. Um, you know the miracle of the loaves? He said to him, how is it you don't understand? Because their king was there. And the king of the Jews, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, would supernaturally provide for his people. That's the whole meaning of the loaves. And he said, what, can't, what, what don't you understand? I'm your king. Here I am. I'm providing for you. Get it? Okay? And as a little child, it's not goo-goo sucking your thumb. No. Dependence. Dependence on their king. You get it? Let's continue. Whosoever there shall... Sh eh, beg your pardon. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, remember, it's Jerusalem, where our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is going to be ruling and reigning from as king of the Jews. Lord, Lord uh, king of kings, Lord of lords. Okay? Okay? And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Yeah, because the king is on the earth, and they're going to have to deal with the king themselves personally. See, Evil isn't executed speedily. Or uh, judgment, excuse me, excuse me. Judgment against an evil work isn't executed speedily, many people think. So they think they're getting away with it. You ain't getting away with it. Every one of us is going to give an account of ourselves unto God. Both saved and you lost people. You Catholics, Jesuit, coadjutor, devils. Okay, yes. Okay. We're going to, the, the Church of the Living God, judgment seat of Christ. The rest of you at the great white throne of judgment. Good luck. Okay? Okay? But see, when the king is on the earth, <laughs> they're going to have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be judged for that. See? Because the king is present during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. 
Now, he's not talking literally, okay? For us today, for our instruction in righteousness, okay, if we're touching things we shouldn't be, if we're putting wicked things before our eyes and stuff like that, get rid of it. You know, get, get rid of whatever it is, okay? But doctrinally, remember, this for our instruction in righteousness, yes. Okay, if we're putting wicked things before our eyes, okay, we're on the computer touching things that we ought not to touch, get rid of it. Repent, okay? Okay? But where... He, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection, okay? When he is offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, okay? The kingdom of heaven is going to be works, by the way, different, not faith. How faith is what? The evidence of things not seen. You're going to be able to see God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of heaven because he's going to be on the throne at Jerusalem. You're going to be able to see him. You're not going to need faith because he's going to be like right there. See, these coadjutors who work for the Vatican, the Jesuits, they lie into you. Are you one of them? Verse 9. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into Hell fire. Okay? First one was what? Your hand. Okay? And feet. Next one is your eye. Your feet taking you to places where you shouldn't be going. You're touching things you shouldn't. You're putting wicked things before your eyes. Our instruction in righteousness. Repent. Get rid of those. Here, during the kingdom of heaven, yeah, not literal, okay, but it's works, not faith, dependent on what you do, because the king is there. You get it? Really? Kingdom of heaven is works. Ooh, oh, are we getting something here? Yeah, let's continue. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more than that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, now here's where coadjutor devils like to, they like to say this, like, you never use this, you're not... Okay, for our instruction in righteousness, Matthew chapter 18, about verse 15 on to verse 18, the context is those who are your brother. Today, if you are of the church of the living God, saved, born again, converted, you know, sealed unto the day of redemption, if you are truly saved, you are my brother. I am your brother. You are my sister. Okay? You and I are brother or sister. Okay? Today. If you are saved, born again. Context here, still, is talking within context of the Jew. Brothers. Okay? Of your own. If you are not saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you ain't my brother. And I am certainly not yours. Okay? I've addressed this before. Devils will like to go to this to accuse you of being unloving, which is a Jesuit tactic. <laughs> Your deceptions are greatly becoming unraveled. But there again, you devils have this one thing for you. Their ignorance is your blitz. Your blitz, not bliss. Yeah. 
Moreover, if thy, verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. Every word may be established. Excuse me. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, the body of people. But if he neglect to hear the church, not the building, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Okay. And whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Oh, that says that right there in Matthew 16, verse 19. And also in Matthew 18, 18. Really? Let's keep, let's keep reading here. Remember what we looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about rewards? Let's continue. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they, that thing that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now hold on about verse 20. Um, today, in this dispensation, if you are saved, born again, and converted, you have God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord is that Spirit living within you. So, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What does that mean? <laughs> again, when our Lord said this, had he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures yet? No. Was the Holy Ghost given unto men as in Acts chapter 2, which the care Catholic, Pentecatholic adheres to as uh, salvation, like their mother, Mystery Babylon, you know, the whore Roman Catholicism does? So, for the where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Because the Holy Ghost wasn't given then at this time when he said this, and this was still under the law, where eternal security was not there, you could lose your salvation. And in the kingdom of heaven, it's works. Because you don't need faith, because the Lord is going to be there. Really? So, verse 20 does not apply for us today at all, because if you are truly saved and born again, he's within you. So, verse 20 applies unto what? The kingdom of heaven. You don't say. Let's read now. On to verse, uh, where were we? Verse 22. Then Peter, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, it talks about the unmerciful servant here, continuing on, which I've already done a video on it, okay? Which one? I could not tell you which one. It's one of them. But it talks about this unmerciful servant. Here's the point. Verse 35, okay? And this is going to explain everything for us, 
Okay? Look at verse 35 in Matthew chapter 18. Okay? Remember, the kingdom of heaven. He had not died, buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures yet. Dispensationally, doctrinally, this was under the law. Eternal security was not there. It was faith and works. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is works. Prove it to you. Verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye forgive, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. What does that mean? Uh, if you don't forgive people, you're not going to be forgiven. That's how it is in the kingdom of heaven, dear friends. If you don't forgive someone, you ain't going to be forgiven. Today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, if you are saved, born again, and converted, you're not going to lose your salvation. You're sealed. You're going to heaven, whether you like it or not. Why wouldn't you like that? I don't know, but I'm, I'm just saying, okay? You're not going to, you cannot lose your salvation today, okay? If you could, then God's a liar. Okay, but see, you get these devils who do not rightly divide the word of truth and try to blend everything in together, together, and it becomes a total mess. See, okay, in the kingdom of heaven, where our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, look at me, is going to be ruling and reigning from. Okay, he's going to be there personally. Okay. It doesn't matter where you're going to be in Jerusalem. You can get a thing out like a, one of those telescopes or binoculars. You are going to, with your fleshly eyes, going to be able to see Jesus Christ, God our Father, sitting on the throne. You are going to be able to see him in the kingdom of heaven. You do not need faith for that. You do not need faith for something that you can see. That's, that's Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, let's, come on. Come on. Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1. Read it out loud with me. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in the kingdom of heaven, you're going to be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Look. Faith is not involved in the kingdom of heaven. Faith and works is involved in the time of Jacob's trouble. But you got these Jesuit coadjutors here on YouTube, hirelings in church buildings, deflecting apparently from Revelation 17 being Roman Catholicism. See, it they're all working together because the end justifies the means for the Jesuit. That's their motto. Okay? For, add the joy of the glory for the greater glory of God. Okay? Okay? The kingdom of heaven is works. In the kingdom of heaven, as we saw in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35, if you don't forgive someone, you ain't going to be forgiven. The, hence, your forgiveness is going to be conditional to what you do in the kingdom of heaven. Today, in this dispensation, you are saved, you're sealed. You could go as one of the church of the living God. You could hold bitterness in your heart and not forgive someone for stepping on your toes or whatever. Yes, you could. It's not going to you're not going to lose your salvation. Your walk 
is going to be a mess. Your insides are probably going to be all knotted. But you're not going to lose your salvation. Yes, unfortunately today, Church of the Living God, if, if you wanted to hold on to a grudge, if you wanted to be bitter, if you wanted to have a hardened heart against everybody, you could. But it ain't going to cost you your salvation. It's going to cost you a whole bunch of other stuff. But it ain't going to cost you your salvation. Listen to me. In the kingdom of heaven, your, your salvation, you being right with God, is based upon what you do. That's called works, dear friend. Okay? The proof of many about the kingdom of heaven is Matthew 18, verse 35. If you don't forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. Okay? You understand? You understand? And with 35, when you go back in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now, see, like I said, the Catholic will take that, meaning that the Catholic Church, the successor of Pope Peter, has the ability to uh, let you go into heaven or the keys to heaven and hell, that kind of stuff, okay? That they can forgive sin. Because remember, the Pope, Vicarious, Vicar, D, or whatever it is, um, is they, he's another Christ. He is Christ's representative on earth. And his Jesuit priests are little Christs. Okay. So, when we see this, remember now, kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? Come on, seriously. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's the actual physical, literal kingdom. Okay. Okay. So, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound on in heaven. If you don't forgive someone in the kingdom of heaven, you're not going to be forgiven. So if you're going to bind that to yourself on earth, well, during the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If you forgive someone during the kingdom of heaven, as it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35, you'll be forgiven. See, that's what that's talking about. Similar, uh, similar in relation to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, meaning what we do is our rewards during the kingdom of heaven. But someone in the kingdom of heaven they don't forgive, they're not forgiven. If they forgive, they are forgiven. That's what Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, and Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 is talking about. Specifically for the kingdom of heaven, dear people. Not applicable for us today. And definitely nothing to do with anything the whore Roman Catholicism teaches you. Okay? That's what that means. It has nothing, nothing to do with today. And remember, Roman Catholicism is replacement theology. The Great Tribulation, as they call it, the rapture, <laughs> whatever. That doesn't appear in Scripture, by the way. Okay? That time period, the Great Tribulation, is for the church according to the Catholic. Okay? Okay? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's for the Jew. The church of the living God will be leaving at the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away. 
wrongly referred to as the rapture. Okay? All right? You're, you're right, yeah. You're not going to find rapture within the scriptures. You're not. As a, as a matter of fact, I don't think you're even going to find the word rapture in one of the Bibles either. Okay? It's the catching away. It's the redemption of the purchased possession. You, you know that. Why on earth are you still using that phrase? Stop it. Stop it. Please. It's, it, it's not that difficult out there when you say they're catching away and they look at you and you say, wrongly referred to as the rapture. That's a lot more easier to do that out there. It, you actually, it's quite successful actually. Please stop it. Okay? But, Matthew chapter 16 Verse 19, and Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, okay? When it says, And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, is talking for number one, specifically for the kingdom of heaven, which is by works. And the perfect example, if you don't forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. If you forgive someone, you're going to be forgiven. You get it, the binding and loosing on earth and in heaven, that kind of thing? That's what that's talking about. Okay? Okay? Now, the key thing. Okay? The key thing. The keys. Okay? And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Now, remember, our Lord Jesus Christ has the key to heaven, uh, to death, and that kind of key of the uh, uh, kingdom of, the, the, of David or whatever. Okay? But he gave, he says right here, and I will give unto thee the kingdom, the key of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Go to Acts. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Okay? Come on, fingers, work with me. Now, our Lord died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He paid for our sins, okay? Upon that, that began this dispensation to time of the Gentiles, okay? But because God is just, fair, and equal, the kingdom of God, the spiritual, was to be offered on to the Jewish people, okay? Now, had the Jewish people as a nation accepted their king He could have come back and established the kingdom of heaven. Okay? He could have. But in Acts chapter 7, when the Jew officially rejected that, us Gentiles were brought in to make them jealous. Okay? All right? This, after the death, burial, and resurrection, that began this dispensation. It did. And yes, it was prophesied that the Jew was going to reject the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, okay? And that we were to be brought in. The scriptures prophesied that, okay? Yes, but see, if our Lord Jesus Christ did not offer that even knowing that it was going to be rejected, his ways are not our ways. He is just, fair, and equal. Because think about it this way, okay? Isaiah chapter 53 said that he was going to be rejected of his own people. There was no beauty in him that he, that he was to be desired. Clearly prophesied of the Jews' rejection of their king. Our Lord, knowing that, didn't have to still offer them the kingdom of heaven. But he did. Knowing what they were going to do. In the book of Acts, which is a transitional book, okay, they got a second chance. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 14. And the sign, I'm going to be linking the Pentecostal video 
the problem with charismatics and that kind of stuff. You're crazy. You're Catholic. You're Catholics. If you're a charismatic Pentecostal, if you're a Pentecostal, you're a Catholic. Done. Your mother is Roman Catholicism. And yes, your mother wears army boots. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the horror of Mystery Babylon. Rome. Never mind. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 14. <laughs> the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he had, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which, he, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Pay attention. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Sumeria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. To the Jew first. Okay? And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Okay? Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Shimon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. And these all continued with, with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Look at verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and said, the number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Why is that significant? The keys. Okay. Peter was not a pope. But obviously. But. As recorded in the book of Acts, Peter was the first one here within this context to take the initiative. Okay? He later on in the book of Peter refers to himself as an elder. Okay? As an elder. All right? All right? He was an elder. He was never a pope. Never. Never. He was not the head of of the twelve, 
like what Catholics t uh, teach, because he was first mentioned. <laughs> okay? No, no. He used the keys right there. Okay? And also in Acts chapter 2. But then we see that James, James, not the brother of John, but James would have preeminence within the church at Jerusalem. Okay? That James, not Peter. Okay? Peter was not a pope. Okay? But those keys utilized here. Okay? Right here in verse 15 and also in Acts chapter 2. But as I said, progressing within the book of Acts, okay, James had preeminence. Peter referred to himself as an elder, not a pope. Okay? Okay? Go to Acts chapter 7 or Acts chapter 8, excuse me. Acts chapter 7. What am I saying? Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and verse 56. Here is Israel's final rejection of the gospel, the kingdom of God, the spiritual. Had they accepted the kingdom of God may well have been the kingdom of heaven. How can we ascertain that? Verse 54 on to verse 60. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. There's a difference between cutting and pricking. You prick something, just a little comes out. You cut them, they bleed like a stuck pig. Okay? And when these guys were cut, what did they do? They stopped their ears and gnashed on him with their, their, their teeth. Who are they gnashing on? Stephen, okay? But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He was standing, okay? Now, could he have come back right then and there at this time? If the Jews had accepted the kingdom of God, the spiritual, which could have led into him coming down and establishing the kingdom of heaven? I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of actually a moot point to argue about. Because... <laughs> Uh, but the point is, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, okay? Kingdom of heaven is talking about the kingdom in Jerusalem. But see, still here, the spiritual, the kingdom of God. Because like I said, kingdom of heaven is always a reference onto the kingdom in Jerusalem. Kingdom of God can mean either spiritual or the kingdom of heaven. It depends on the context, Okay. Not the uniform translation like Mason MacArthur likes to do. Okay? No. Could Jesus have come back and established the kingdom of heaven if his people would have accepted him? I don't know. But see, the point is, it was prophesied that they wouldn't and that we would be brought in. I will anger you by a foolish nation. It was prophesied even in the Torah. But see, he, as a just God, still had to offer it. So in that sense, the kingdom of heaven could have still been available had the Jewish people accepted it. Even at this. But with the stoning of Stephen, verse 7, 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Stopped their ears, refused to hear. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. Stoned him. Interesting. And the witnesses laid their, down their clothes at the young man's feet, at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And what kind of witness and testimony did that have on Saul, who later would become who? 
And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Thought they were doing God's service. And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Oh, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then you see Saul persecuting the church, the people, not the building. And then Philip goes to Samaria. And then you see the Ethiopian eunuch. You get it? So, binding in heaven and on earth in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and Matthew 18, 18, has everything to do with the kingdom of heaven, because during the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be works. And if you do not forgive someone in the kingdom of heaven, you are not forgiven. That's the best example of it. That's what that is talking about. The Lord gave no special authority to Peter, okay? The key thing, yes, okay, he took the initiative, but remember, Peter was not a pope. Peter referred to himself as an elder. James had the preeminence in the body of believers at Jerusalem, not Peter. Uh, Cornelius went down to kneel before Peter, and he's like, stand up, man. I'm a man too, okay? Okay. Peter sinned. Peter, because of the brethren sent from James in Galatians, dissembled with them, with the Jews. And Paul rebuked Peter. Peter was not a pope. Okay? The rock is Christ, not Peter. Okay? So, that is what that means. It has everything to do with the kingdom of heaven. It's binding and loosing because in the kingdom of heaven, it's works. Okay? So, that's going to be it for that for this video. Um, today, I am officially 13 years old. 13 years ago this day, the Lord saved me, a sinner who is chief. And praise the Lord for what he has done, for saving someone, a wretch like me. I hope the Lord saves you. And you Catholic, I don't hate you. I hate your system. Your religion is the religion of the son of perdition, that man of sin. Your church is going to be the one world church during the time of Jacob's trouble. And that man of sin, the son of perdition, inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist, um, he's going to be the one that you're looking for. I hope you repent. I hope that your eyes will be opened and you get out of that system because that system is taking you to hell. And a lot of the people here on YouTube and outside your door are working for the Vatican are either Jesuits themselves, at the very least, coadjutors. So, that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully this helped um, some of you. Um, for the individual who asked this question, hopefully this will answer it for you. Okay? So, that's going to be it. Thank you so much for watching, if you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love you. And we will see you in the next video. Whenever that will be.